Looks like uh, we're all about in here. Uh, this is the art of defiling, defeating forensic analysis by me, the Grug. Uh, this is basically what we're going to go over today. Uh, we've got an introduction, uh, some general information, stuff like that. Then we're going to go over some of the background information you'll need to know in order to understand the anti-forensics attacks. So we're going to have a look at uh, the forensics process and some of the forensics methodologies that get used. Then we're going to look at anti-forensics in theory. So we're going to look at uh, the principles and the strategies which get used for anti-forensics attacks. Uh, then we're going to look at several different implementations of anti-forensics attacks. So we're going to look at file system, uh, below the file system, and beyond the file system attacks. And then there's a Q&A session, which, uh, depending on how fast I go, could last from five minutes to a half hour. So um, Generally speaking, throughout the presentation, if you got any questions, shoot your hand up and shout them out. Okay. Um, this is me. I'm a drug. Uh, I break forensics tools. Uh, it's fun. Um, basically, the, the reason I do this is forensics tools are just like any other security technology. They're, they're similar to firewalls and IDS systems, but for some reason, there's no one out there providing the same sort of uh, critical analysis that you find with IDS systems or off-the-shelf technologies. So uh, basically, I'm, I'm doing a service to the security community by making the job of the police more difficult. OK, so this is our lightning tour of forensics. Everyone get ready. We're about to like blaze through this, and you'll all be experts. OK, introduction. These five things are all we need to remember. Right? These are the, the five core bits of any forensics analysis. And then we've got a conclusion at the end. So basically, we've got acquisition. Ac oh. Oh. We've got acquisition, preservation, identification, evaluation, and presentation. All right? uh, it sounds annoying and difficult, but it's actually really straightforward. It's basically data capture, data analysis, data presentation. But we'll get to that later. Uh, I have no idea. I seriously doubt it. I, I didn't send them in. so. <laughs> Unless they've got some magic hack. I don't think they've got my slides. Um, if you give me your business card, I'll be happy to spam you. <laughs> OK. Uh, the idea behind forensics analysis is it's actually a scientific process. If there's a scientific method, it's reproducible, it's verifiable. You can run it again and again and again, and you always get the same results. Uh, in practice, it's not entirely like that. But generally speaking, this is what we like to believe. So the idea is that you come out with a hypothesis. You test your hypothesis against the data that you have available, and you reach a conclusion. And so generally, the hypothesis is something along the lines of, this guy's been looking at child pornography. You test it by taking his system. You see whether there's child pornography there, whether it's been accessed. If there is, then you could say, our conclusion is, this guy has been looking at child pornography. And if there's not, then you can say, this guy does not look at child pornography, and that's that. That's the theory. In practice, it's ten it tends to be a lot more complex. Uh, oh, yeah. Analysis versus investigation. This is something that really pisses me off. Basically, um, people always talk about digital forensic analysis. And I think that this comes nowadays from CSI, where everyone's got this vision of these like forensic scientists who are all like sexy and cool, and they run around with guns and stuff like that. And they somehow solve cases simply based on scientific evidence. And it's like the old Sherlock Holmes Victorian thing, the belief that somehow we can, we can fix everything with science. And unfortunately, in the real world, it's not like that. Most of the time, cases are solved with confessions. So what will happen is the uh, detective in charge of the investigation will call in the forensic scientists, they'll conduct an analysis, and they'll present their conclusions to the detective, who will then proceed with the investigation. All right? Uh, generally, what that means is once he's got enough to catch a suspect, they'll take him in, and they'll just start talking to him until he eventually confesses. So most of the coppers I know actually talk about themselves as salesmen. Uh, one guy said, my job is to sell people jail sentences. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, the whole forensics thing, uh, it's, it's completely different in the digital world. What you have is 
a investigator who conducts his own analysis and then uses his own conclusions to further his investigation. Uh, in the, the uh, physical world, it's separate. You've got someone who's got a doctorate who does the analysis separate from someone who does the investigation. So that's the difference over here. I prefer to talk about digital forensic investigations because it's, it's an entire process. It's not just the analysis phase. Uh, when we talk about uh, digital forensics, we're actually we're talking about getting evidence. And when we talk about evidence, there's three types. There's exculpatory, inculpatory, and tampering. Exculpatory means it excludes someone. Inculpatory means that it includes them. This is basically in terms of guilt. So if we find exculpatory evidence, we say, all right, there's evidence that this guy did not commit this crime. Inculpatory would be he did commit the crime. And tampering is he's been fiddling around with his box. Tampering doesn't really mean anything, but it can invalidate your results. Right, chain of evidence. We can ignore the chain of evidence because that's, um, it's basically really big, ugly stuff that you have to do for court that we don't need to do in um, more exciting things, such as catching hackers. So if all we want to do is actually find out who did something and we're just doing our own investigation at home or uh, on a box at work and we don't plan on going to court, we don't worry about a chain of evidence. If we do worry about a chain of evidence, that means from the instant that we find out that an incident has occurred until the instant we fucking present that in court, it's document everything from like 9.15, walked in the door, 9.17, sat down at desk, 9.17 and you know, 30 seconds, turned on computer, you know, got disk serial number, blah, blah, blah out. It's, it's absolutely insane. And if you don't do it, it gets chucked out. But we ignore that. Right. So if we look at forensics, it basically comes down into to three broad areas that we, want to, that we want to work with. The first one is data capture. This is where we try and gather absolutely everything that could have evidence on it that we could use for our analysis. Then it's data analysis. This is where we actually conduct our analysis, where we sift through that data and we try and pull out everything that could be evidence. And we uh, then move into data presentation, where we do something with that evidence. So. Those are the broad categories. When we look at the process, we have uh, these phases, which is acquisition and preservation, which are the first stages. Uh, this is the data capture. Uh, identification and evaluation are actually iterative phases. Uh, I think I've got slides which look into them a little bit more. But those are the analysis phase. This is where you go through. Identification is basically you run through and you look at everything that looks like it could be evidence. Evaluation is where you analyze that evidence. You say, is this actually useful to our investigation? And sometimes you'll find out that you actually need to get more information. So you'll go back and you'll redo your identification phase. And then presentation is where you take whatever you've done and you move on to the next step, where you either prosecute someone, or you get uh, more server logs from uh, another location, or you go to court, or whatever it is that you're doing. So acquisition is basically the easiest phase, right? This is where you go in and you basically just lift disks. Very straightforward stuff. Um, there are several types of data that you could be trying to acquire. There's volatile data and non-volatile data. <coughs> volatile data is obviously data that changes. So this is anything on the network or anything in memory processors, stuff like that. Volatile data tends to be very, very difficult to capture properly. Unless you're already gathering everything that you, you think you might need before an incident occurs, it's too late. So uh, Generally speaking, most, most forensics is done on non-volatile data, which is stuff from the file system. So uh, FBI recommendation is as soon as you come in to see something, you pull the power plug out, and then you remove the disk, which means from, well, we'll get into it from an anti-forensics point of view. But it means that if it's not on the disk, it's not going to make it to the, the, uh, the investigation portion. This is where we would start our chain of evidence documentation, by the way. So this would be like when we show up on site, we capture the disks, we start writing down the serial numbers, uh, which boxes they were in, that sort of thing. Uh, there's various different tools out there to capture volatile data from the memory point of view. That's usually PS, PCAT. Uh, I don't know what you use on Windows. I don't think there's anything that's actually useful. Uh, but you attempt to capture everything out of memory and then conduct your analysis later. Uh, we're going to ignore that for now because if you breaking into boxes, you probably have a good rootkit and people can't access your memory or processes. Right, so once, we, once we've captured the disks or once we've captured the memory or the, the network traffic, what we need to do is we need to preserve it. We need to freeze it in a state that will allow us to go to court and say, this is exactly what we were working on. And you can verify that. And then you can take this, what you have from this stage, and anyone else can follow your documentation and reproduce your results. 
So essentially what this falls down into is just making bit level copies. Right? So once you, once you seize the hard disk, you just copy it to another disk and you analyze that second disk. So you always do your analysis on a second copy. You never do your analysis on the original because there's a chance that you're going to screw up. And if you damage the data, then you can't actually use it in any way, um, at least from a, a court point of view. If you're just actually looking for stuff because someone broke into your home box, well, you're going to be a lot, a lot more uh, flexible with that. But generally speaking, it's acquisition, then preservation immediately. Uh, hash summing, right? So you just take a hash of everything. All right, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You want to be able to prove that the copy that you have is identical to the original and that anyone who operates on copies will operate on identical copies to the one that you're operating on. So you MD5 sum or you SHA-1, very straightforward. Uh, labeling, that's unimportant. But basically, um, what happens a lot is one 80, gig dri one 80 gig drive looks identical to another 80 gig drive, especially when you have 20 of them. All right? So people who like do a lot of seizing suddenly find that they've got stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of Ziploc drives, and they need to figure out which one relates to which case. And this is where labeling becomes very important. So it's basically just auditing and keeping Excel spreadsheets and keeping track of what's going on. And it's very boring. Um, and we start our analysis documentation, which is basically the serial number of this drive you know, was found from this PC. And we conducted our analysis, and this is what we found. So if we're going to look at identification, which is our next phase, what we do is we feed in a bitstream copy. We then use some tools to format that copy into a file system. We go through that file system, we locate our files, and then we get our evidence. So we start with our bit level copy. We've got, we've got an exact copy of our original data. And as we go through it, we start looking for things which um, could be useful for our investigation. We don't actually do analysis at this phase. We simply format our input data into something that our tools can parse properly. They parse it out, and then we start looking for stuff like log files or uh, possible evidentiary files, such as binaries or trojans. Um, we start looking for anything that might be useful for our identification, uh, sorry, our evaluation phase, anything that could be part of the investigation. So uh, this is where we use tools which provide what I like to call total file system awareness. Right? They give you complete pictures of the file system. So you can extract deleted content. You can get extra information about files. So you can look at all of the metadata that exists. You can look at file content. You can do huge amounts of searching. So you can grab through like 80 gigs or a terabyte's worth of data rapidly. Well, not so rapidly, but you, get, you try and find anything that could be useful. Straightforward enough. Uh, and we continue our uh, analysis documentation. So once we've pulled out everything that we think might be useful, we then have to actually look at it and figure out if it is useful. So this is, this is the nasty part of child pornography cases. So once you've extracted all of the image files, you have to look at them and determine whether they're actually child porn. Um, a huge amount of effort is going into making that a lot easier for the cops. So one of the things that they're doing is they're constructing these hash databases. So they just hash everything, and then they can compare the hashes of the files against known bad images, so they don't actually need to keep looking at them, because they can be quite traumatizing. Um, right, so we examine our data, and then we figure out if it's actually useful. So does it have any relevance to the case that we're prosecuting? Does it support our hypothesis? Can we use it? And if necessary, do we have to go back to our identification phase and find more files or more information? So we will iterate over this phase and the previous phase several times. Our analysis phase will be the longest part of our investigation. It could take days, uh, weeks, possibly months if you're stupid. Um, if we go, yeah, if we need more information, we go back to identification. That covers it. And that's it. We finish our analysis. We're done. And now we go on and we do something with it. So basically, forensics analysis is always conducted for a purpose. Right? You don't sit down and go, you know what would be fun today? I'm going to look at some file systems. All right. Well, I do. But um, <laughs> essentially, you guys will only be doing this because you have to. And that's, that's what it's like in the real world. People do this because there's a purpose. They have to end up somewhere. And this is the final phase. So once they've conducted everything, they get a, a ream of documentation, and they get their findings, and they do something with it. So they take it to court, or they go to an employee tribunal, or they go and they request an ISP to hand over logs, or they do something beyond that. This, this is the final phase. So that's it. And we're done with our, our chain of evidence. 
So now everyone is an, an absolutely perfect forensics expert. You've got everything that you need to know. You've got acquisition, preservation, identification, evaluation, and uh, presentation. We're good? Everyone? Excellent. Let's move on. So now let's look at how we can break that entire process. We're going to look at every single phase of that and try and damage it and make it not work properly. So uh, this is what I've been doing since 1999, which is reducing the quantity and quality of forensics evidence. OK, so we're going to look at the broad problems that exist with digital forensics today, um, just general issues that haven't been fixed. We're going to look at how we can attack the process. And then we're going to look at strategies that we can take out of those attacks and that we can then turn into actual implementations later on. OK. So, uh, introduction. Um, yeah. Basically, anti-forensics, uh, I, I don't know why it's called anti-forensics. It's the same thing as calling uh, a lot of network penetration testing like anti-IDS or anti-firewall. It's simply attacks against known security technologies. But that's what it is. It's an attempt to, to mitigate the effectiveness of a, a forensics investigation. And this can be done for several reasons. Uh, usually, it's done in the wild by uh, child pornographers who don't want to go to jail with uh, big men who will beat them. And it's done by uh, hackers occasionally, though we'll look at why they usually don't bother. Uh, it's done by dodgy employees who look at uh, stuff that they shouldn't look at during work hours. And surprisingly enough, it's actually done uh, quite frequently by Al Qaeda. So there's actually uh, a lot of demand for anti-forensics technology and counter anti-forensics technology within the war on terrorism. I, uh, I met some US Army general or major who came up to me and goes, you're helping the war on terrorism, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely hilarious. But um, so that's it. It's, it's actually used primarily on Windows machines. It's used mostly by pedophiles, and it's used mostly by um, dodgy terrorist types. Hackers and more interesting people don't need to bother, and we're going to look at that in a second. But before then, let's look at the broad problems that exist with digital forensics. And it basically comes down to this, right? Forensics analysts have very, very short amount of time. Right? There are more cases than there are people who are qualified to handle them. What that means is generally someone is going to have a fixed period of time to conduct their analysis. So this is what I call the two-day rule. If someone has two days to conduct an analysis, which is uh, 16 hours, which is typical in the police force, and you come up with an attack that takes 17 hours to detect, you win. They're going to spend two days looking for it. They're going to have to stop. And there you go. You, you manage to evade their, uh, their analysis simply by taking up more time than they have to spend. So that's one of the attacks that you can do. Generally, you don't need to worry about that because you're going to use attacks which are more sophisticated than that. However, you don't need to worry about uh, these people having huge amounts of time to look for like weird anomalies and things like that. If it's not obvious, they're going to have to move on. Usually, they're short on skills. So what happens is uh, someone who's been in the force for eight years is offered a reward. They say, look, we'll, we'll promote you up into this great cozy position. You sit around in your ass all day. You click on things. You use a computer a bit. And uh, we call it forensics. And the guy goes, that's brilliant. I'll have some of that. So they kick the guy upstairs. They put him in this thing. They send him on an NK certification or a forensics toolkit certification. And he learns how to click the right buttons and generate a report. It doesn't mean he knows how to do forensic analysis. It means that he knows how to use a piece of software. And there's a huge difference, right? So anyone out there who does pen testing knows that there's a difference between someone who knows how to use Nessus and someone who knows how to break into networks. And it's the same thing with forensics. You've got a whole lot of people out there who know how to use uh, sort of forensics vulnerability scanners. Right? They know how to use these forensics tools, which basically do everything for them. They don't know how to actually do forensic analysis. What that means is if we can find bugs in their tools, we can find ways of evading their analysis. That's good for us. So they're almost always slaves to their tools. They know how to use a specific piece of software. right? They know how to use a small subset of that software's capabilities. And they use that for everything. And that's supposed to be a forensic analysis. It's actually not. And we'll look at why. And it comes down to this. Forensic software is software. And anyone who works in security knows that software has bugs. Okay? With forensic software, these bugs are particularly bad. It's like having a firewall that doesn't block ICMP just because they forgot about that protocol. You find things like that. They, just, they miss huge gaps in how things are supposed to work, and they just get away with it. But 
there's, there's two types of bugs that affect forensic software. One is the traditional security bugs. So we've got your integer overflows, your format strings, your buffer overflows, all of this stuff. It's usually in directory passing code, as a, a subtle hint to anyone who wants to go out and write this stuff. And it's usually very, very easy to exploit. They, they just do stupid things that disappeared from the real world a long time ago. But more interestingly, they also incorrectly implement the file systems. So they don't spend enough time looking at the file system specifications. They simply go with, uh, you know, get it to work, get it out the door, move on to the next project. What that means is if we know the file system specification better than they do, we can find holes that we can exploit. So we should get to those in a minute. So we can look at forensics, the forensics process, as simply a security technology. It's just as vulnerable as any other security technology, only there's less attention paid to it. So it's, it's more backwards, it's more behind. Um, we can attack every single phase that we've looked at. So we can attack acquisition, we can attack preservation, though I'm not entirely sure how useful that is. We can attack identification, evaluation, and uh, finally we can attack presentation. So let's have a look at those attacks. So the first one is pretty easy. Uh, to avoid acquisition, don't get caught, right? If you're not caught, no one's going to seize your hard disk. So this is what most hackers go for. Right? If they're skilled enough to be using an anti-forensic attack, they're skilled enough not to get caught. Most of the people who start investigations are sysadmins who are overworked and find something funny on a box. And then they have two choices. One, they can cover it up and hope that no one uh, fires them for it. Or two, they could, they could escalate it. Generally speaking, they're going to cover it up because it's, it's just not worth the hassle. So they'll just rebuild the box and let it go. On the other hand, sometimes they will escalate it, in which case they're going to find that it was some 12-year-old Romanian kid who dot-clicked his way in there, and that's it. It's, it's really, really boring stuff that you find. Like, uh, we, we did an analysis on a box where the rootkit hid the entire slash user directory, right? So like, we log in, and we're like, that's funny. <laughs> the system's gone. And, uh, that, that was our first clue. And after that, we found out that they'd installed the CyBNC where they were logging in directly from their home, uh, their home phone numbers, right? So they're li logging in directly to this box and then bouncing into their channel. So we log in and we're like, dudes, <laughs> you guys have no clue. Like, go home. And uh, yeah, that, that was kind of fun. Uh, decent way to send it a Sunday afternoon. But anyway, acquisition. It, the easiest way of avoiding it is you just don't get caught. And this is what most people go for. But if we skip that, we end up with destroying hardware, right? So if there's nothing there for them to capture, they can't acquire it. So uh, this is where like the degaussers and like uh, burpeen hammers and rocks and all this other stuff comes into play. You basically take your hard disk and you smash it up. If it's broken, they can't reconstruct it. I, I don't care who they are. There's just there's nothing they can do if it's ground up into little bits of shard and dust and and like, broken glass and stuff. That's it. It's over with. Um, the other one is we can eradicate the data. So we, we can go at the hardware level or we can go at the software level. The software level, it's a little bit more complicated and it's a little bit harder to do properly, but you can do it remotely. So that's what we're going to be looking at as a, a strategy when we, when we look at anti-forensics attacks in the real world. Preservation, um, I don't know, there's birthday attacks against uh, bit streams, but it, I mean, it's kind of pointless. I don't, I don't know how you could actually get around preservation, and it doesn't really matter. It's simply part of the data acquisition process. <coughs> Excuse me. So once we've, once we've uh, failed to somehow avoid acquisition, we end up having to avoid analysis. So when we look at how we can get around identification, there's several different techniques. One is we cannot leave any evidence to be identified. Uh, this, is the, this is what most people do these days. They, they operate entirely off the hard disk. There's nothing left behind for you to find. The other one is we can hide things. We can hide the evidence such that when you come across a box and you start looking for it, your tools aren't going to be able to see where you should be looking. And as a result, you won't be able to find anything. So that's, that's the other way of avoiding identification. In terms of avoiding evaluation, this is pretty straightforward. We can use encryption, right? Because it's 2005, everyone encrypts everything, right? We're not stupid. We, we, we know that we can hide something, but we know it's going to get found eventually. And when it is found, it's going to be random data, and that's the end of it. We can also use proprietary data formats, which is fairly common. So we can use our own version of uh, compression and archiving files. Right? And that's just going to make it harder for someone else to actually conduct analysis. I've seen people have actually implemented their own binary formats 
so that you can't do a binary analysis. Now, presentation attacks are actually the most common. Usually, the people on the defense don't know enough about computers to go after any of, any of the earlier attacks. They simply wait until they get to court, and then they try and take advantage of the fact that judges don't know what the hell's going on. So we come up with, with basically, the, the, the most common things are the Trojan defense, which is where you say, listen, you can prove that this computer hacked into Microsoft, but you can't prove that it was me sitting at this computer. There was a Trojan. Someone came in, and they installed something, and they made my computer do stuff. And I'm very sorry that it happened. And I, you know, I'll do better next time, but it's not my fault. It was my computer. And this one is really, really common, and it's actually usually successful. Uh, the variation on it, which is, is really scary, is called the invisible Trojan defense. And there's recently been a case in the UK where a guy was let off by saying, a Trojan that you cannot find installed itself on my computer, downloaded child pornography, viewed the child pornography several times, and then removed itself so effectively that you cannot prove that it was ever there. And the judge said, my god, that's horrible. You know? <laughs> And it's also known as the dog ate my homework. Yeah, it's the dog ate my homework defense, right? So this is, this is the wiki defense of information security, right? Um, it's terrible. They, they've set a precedent, and it's going to be used a lot. And I know that the, the forensic community is flipping out. They're trying to find a way of proving that something that doesn't exist doesn't exist, right? <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, there's, there's ways of proving the Trojan defense doesn't make sense, but the invisible Trojan defense is like terrifying. The, the most common one, actually, is they just confuse the judge. Right? They say, well, is it, well, well they'll get the, the, uh, the guy who conducted the, the analysis on the stand, and they'll say, is it possible that random bits of data lying about on the hard disk just happened to be a JPEG image of an underage boy? And the guy will go, well, yeah, theoretically, it's possible. And the judge goes, hmm, yeah. <laughs> so usually, this is, the, this is the approach that people use. And it's also very scary, because we're relying on people who don't know anything about computers making judgments about very, very complex things. And people get off all the time simply by convincing the judge that this mysterious, magical object, the computer, did something weird. And like I might have been in the room at the time, but I had nothing to do with it, um, which is why we rely on confessions, which is why forensic analysis is actually not very useful when it comes to prosecuting people. It's why they actually get a guy in a room and they just go over a story again and again and again and again and again until he cracks, until it changes a little bit. And they go, oh, wait a minute. Last time you said that the reason you went to a cyber cafe was for this. And now you say you didn't go to the cyber cafe. Which one is it? And they'll go after him until eventually the guy admits that he was doing whatever he's been accused of doing. And that's that. So this is why a confession is still the number one thing for the police to use. And it's also why, uh, if anyone's interested, I can tell you how to avoid getting busted by confessions, um, because you don't really need any of this other stuff. So when we look at that as a whole, we've now, we've now seen several specific attacks against the process. We can abstract those into broad strategies. And they all center around the core principle of anti-forensics, which is that data is evidence. Right, if we look at the forensics process, it's you know, data capture, data analysis, data presentation. It all revolves around data. So if we can prevent the data from being there, we can prevent them from finding the data. If we can avoid them accessing the data, we win. So that's what we have to remember. Data is evidence. So when we look at broad strategies that we can use, there's, there's several things. We can destroy the data, which I've called quite cleverly data destruction. We can hide the data, which is data hiding. Or we can prevent the data from ever being created, which is data contraception. So data destruction is actually much more difficult than it sounds, right? because what you have is a situation where file systems are now very, very complex things. When you create files and you access files, all sorts of weird data all over the place is modified, updated, and changed. If you then want to do an effective data destruction attack, you have to restore the file system to the pre-file state. So you have to go through and you have to find everything that's changed and reset it to how it was beforehand. And that's a little bit more difficult than it sounds. It's not impossible. It's just a little bit more complex. So usually what we're doing is we're going after file content. Right? This is the easy one. So this is what people who use wipe or SRM or uh, BC wipe or any of the other like evidence eliminator sort of attacks do. What they do is they overwrite the file content with something that's garbage, then something that's null. So the idea is that 
if they can only find out that a file existed called underageboys.jpg, they can't actually say that it was porn because it's simply a file name, right? And there's no content that they can use against you. And the next one, which is the step up, is when you go after the file system metadata. So when you go after the data that exists, which describes the file content, when you go and you remove that, they can't even access any of the information that isn't there anymore. So they can't determine whether the file existed, what it was called, how big it was, who owned it, when it was created. They've got no information at all. So that's, that's generally what we want to aim at. So the idea is that we basically we completely remove everything. So we want to get rid of all the metadata and all the data. Anything else? Uh, this one is very, very common, altering timestamps. Right? So typically what happens is someone will break into a system They'll take a snapshot of the file system state, so they'll capture all of the timestamp information. They will install their rootkits, they will do whatever funny stuff they want to do, and then they will store all of the timestamp information back to the original state from pre-break-in. Right? So when you come across and you find the rootkit, you don't know when the incident occurred. And you cannot say that at this time, this thing was installed here because that information no longer exists. So that's the most common one you'll find in the wild. Uh, anything else? Yeah, well, ultimately what this means is your file system is not a secure trusted log of what's happened on the system, right? It's just a piece of software uh, generated output that can be edited just like anything else. It's just like any log file, you can't trust it. Well, that's data destruction. Uh, it's not very interesting. There's a couple of tools that I wrote a while ago that you could use. Uh, I think there might be some better tools out there now. I don't know if they're public, but they're not that hard to write. More interesting is data hiding. So when we look at data hiding, we want to look at what the requirements are for a good data hiding strategy and a good data hiding attack. Then we're going to look at a methodology, and then we're going to look at some implementations. So the first one with a data hiding requirement is it needs to be covert. Right? If it's not hidden, it's not a good data hiding attack. So I know some guy who thought that a really, really clever move was to put a dot in front of the file name on Unix systems to hide it from system administrators. Right? That's not an effective strategy for hiding things from uh, someone doing a forensic analysis. So typically what we want to do is we actually want to exploit a bug in a forensics tool. So we want to find somewhere on the file system that the forensics tool cannot look. We want to find some issue with the forensic system, uh, the, the forensic software's implementation of the file system that we can exploit and force it to do what we want it to do rather than what the forensics analyst wants it to do. It needs to be reliable, right? We don't, want to, we don't want to put data in, come back a month later, and find it gone. If we wanted our data to disappear, we would use a data hiding attack, sorry, a data destruction attack, not a data hiding attack. So data hiding needs to be done in a way that we can put data in and get it out without any problems. Uh, this means that people who come up with things like you just take a random bunch of slack space at the end of the file system and put data in there and hope that it's still there when you come back, that's not effective. Right. First of all, there's tools that can be used to analyze and locate that information and extract it anyway. Uh, we use that in my course. One of them is called Foremost. And there's also a high chance that you will lose your data. So that's, that's not very good. Second of all, oh, sorry. finally, we need it to be secure. Right? So we want to put our stuff in, and we want to know that only we can access it. And there's two ways of doing that. First of all, we can use an attack that only we know about that we've written the tool for. And the second way is we can encrypt everything. And we're going to be using both. So when we talk about our, our methodology, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to talk about fisting. Fisting is the file system insertion and subversion technique. It's basically stuffing data in places it doesn't belong. So you use metadata in uh, complex structures for data storage. So we use metadata in file systems, which means things like directory files, journal files. Uh, we can use metadata within OLE2 files, which is uh, document files for um, the, the Word Microsoft Office stuff. Uh, we can use just about anything that's got space that's not supposed to be treated as data for data storage. There's a problem, of course. Modifying metadata is dangerous. So you have to remember, obey the fisk. Right? You need to make sure that you don't screw things up so badly that you're going to damage the actual file system or you're going to damage the data that people are trying to look at or that your, uh, your attack is going to be so poorly executed it's going to be corrected and you're going to lose your data, because that's bad. So right now you're probably wondering, what holes can I fist? Well, if we take this as your entire file system specification, right, this, this large green area, anything within that is valid as part of your file system. 
You have a tool such as FSCK, which is going to implement a very, very large portion of that specification, but not everything. Then you have your forensic software, which is going to have some overlap, but once again, is not going to implement everything. And finally, you're going to have your kernel. So these are, generally speaking, the three major pieces of software that you need to worry about when you're coming up with an attack. But as you can see, you can fist here. There's holes, there's areas of the specification which haven't been properly thought out or properly implemented. So we're going to be exploiting these gray areas. So fisting is a powerful methodology for data hiding. We can use it with just about everything. And we will be using it with just about everything. And it's very effective against forensics analysis because the majority of forensic analysis doesn't treat metadata as data storage. It treats it simply as metadata. Right? So it's looking at it incorrectly. And we can exploit that. And finally, um, yeah, we'll be looking at some fisting implementations after we get through some file system stuff. More interesting is uh, the, new, the new area of anti-forensics research. There's actually a lot of work being done right now on this stuff. Right? Data contraception. This is where we want to prevent data from showing up on the hard disk. So we do everything we can to keep stuff in memory in a way that it cannot be accessed or uh, interpreted or captured or in, in a state that it will not enter into the forensics process. So uh, the idea is no data is good data. Okay? So there's basically there's two primary routes we want to use. One is we want to reduce the quantity, and the other is we want to reduce the quality of evidence. So to reduce the quantity, we just minimize disk activity. We minimize everything that leaves evidence behind. So we reduce the number of times that we interact with the file system in every way possible. Right? We also use something they call evidence prophylactics. These are things which insulate you from the operating system so that you can operate entirely in your own environment and trust that you're not going to be using APIs which inadvertently access and update information that you don't want updated. And by reducing the quality of data, every time that we actually do need to interact with the file system, we can do it with generic tools. We can do it with tools which exist on every system out there rather than with custom developed tools. Because if we use generic tools, it doesn't mean anything. So when someone comes across and says, all right, your Linux server was hacked. We found a copy of GDB and Gork and Sed installed. Someone's going to go, well, yeah, but what? I mean, what else did you find? It's not going to be useful. They can't prove anything. It simply ends up with being, all right, we found three pieces of GNU software, which in my opinion is a crime itself. But <laughs> so if we, if we will look at how we can limit the quantity of information, very, very common is non-evidentiary rootkits. Right? This is stuff that leaves no information at all behind, in theory. So we operate entirely in memory. So this basically means in-memory patching. So people who use Socket or uh, Adore when it's installed correctly. Uh, I've seen people who backdoor Apache processes. I've seen uh, all sorts of SSHD stuff. We're all quite familiar with this sort of thing. right? It's just you operate entirely in memory. So once you get onto a box, you inject your stuff directly into memory. You don't create a file and then load everything up from there. That's lame. Right? One of the other things that we do is we do all of our execution purely in memory. So when we, need, when we need to start a new process, we'll use something like user land exec to take a binary and just load it straight up. We won't use the kernel to read it off the disk. We can read it directly off the wire. We can also do scripting directly into memory. This is a very, very simple technique. I'm surprised it's not more common. Basically, rather than uploading a script file and running it, you, you start up the script interpreter and you paste the script file in over standard in. Right? It's going to operate in the exact same way, only there's not going to be evidence on the file system of the script that you ran. So in terms of reducing uh, quantity, those are the basic things that we can do. So we can operate entirely in memory. The other thing that we can do is we can use an evidence prophylactic. This is an IUD, an inter or an intra user land device. This is basically something which operates in an address space and provides remote access to that address space to someone else. So we can use GDB, or we can use the hacked process. Um, Immunity and Core SDI, or I think they're called Core ST these days, have been doing this for quite a long time with uh, MOSDEF and IMPACT, respectively. Right? These take an exploited process, and they inject code directly into that. They don't bust into a shell and then upload new tools and start working from there. They use the existing process, and they operate entirely in memory. This means that when the box gets rebooted, there's no evidence left behind. That's not why they implemented this stuff, but that's, that's the effect anyway. Um, 
you could also use GDB. So if you have a traditional exploit that just drops you to a shell, you can upload GDB and you could start accessing it and use it as an IUD from there. So these are quite powerful and they allow you to operate entirely in memory remotely. And these are used fairly commonly these days. Okay, and then in terms of reducing the quality of evidence left behind, they use common tools, as I said before. They reveal little about the intent of the attacker. Right? There's not a lot of information left behind by someone who uses orc. It's, it's standard, it's everywhere, and we don't know what it was used for. It means that we tend to use a lot of stuff built from shell scripts rather than a lot of stuff built from C code. Shell scripts, as I said before, we can execute entirely in memory simply by starting a shell and then pasting everything into that. So you're going to find that a lot of rootkits these days actually include a huge amount of shell scripts, which I think is quite interesting because uh, shell scripting something is usually a lot more complex and exciting than writing it in C. So there you go. That's anti-forensics in terms of strategy. So we've got data destruction, data hiding, and data contraception. So uh, <laughs> file system attacks gone wild, live and uncensored. So this is anti-forensics in action. We're going to be looking at three basic areas. We're going to look at below the file system. So this is partition table attacks, what we can do before we even get to file system attacks. We're going to look at attacks within the file system. We're going to be looking specifically at ext2, but we can use similar attacks on every single file system out there. Uh, however, for uh, moral reasons, I refuse to release attacks that can be used by pedophiles. So I, I will not release any NTFS or FAT uh, file system attacks because those are going to be used by the wrong sorts of people. Uh, ext2, uh, it's common and it's going to be used by hackers and that's all right. And then we're going to look beyond the file system. So we're going to look at how we can do attacks purely in memory without interacting with the file system at all. So deep disking, it came from below the file system. If we're looking at partition table attacks, we have to look at partition tables. And I apologize now because this is ugly. This was designed by Microsoft. It's DOS. It's like horrendous. I don't, know, I don't know what happened, but I hope they shoot the guy who came up with it. Um, partition tables, we have to remember, only mean something for software. Right? They're, not at the hardware to, they're not at a hardware level. There's simply information that we put on a hard disk that tells software, you know, use this slice of the hard disk as a partition. It's, it's not hardware layer. Because it's operated in software, it's a format. And because it's a format, it has to be implemented by a bunch of different people. And it's implemented in slightly different ways by different people, which leads to problems. But basically, it only has meaning for about three types of software. The first one is the operating system. Right? This is a very important piece of software on your, your computer. And we need to make sure that any attacks that we do don't interfere with your operating system, because you could, you could lose a huge amount of data or render your box completely inoperable. Next of all is disk editors, right? This is obviously the stuff that interacts directly with the partition table. Uh, there's actually some attacks we can look at that break a lot of disk editors, but we won't be doing that. And then finally, the interesting one is forensics tools. So most forensics tools take partition tables for granted. They only really worry about the file system layer stuff, and they only worry about the file system layer stuff in a very superficial way. So if we can get away with this sort of attack, we don't need to worry about later attacks. OK. Um, Ooh, good stuff. Right? There's a lot of cool things with using this sort of attack. Right? They're, they're file system neutral, so you can change the file system you're using without any problem, and you don't need to write libraries to interact with weird file systems. They attack forensic tool integrity at a very, very low layer, which means that you can basically avoid the entire forensics process rapidly by coming in at this layer. And that's a good thing. It's very powerful. As I said before, they're usually taken for granted. Unfortunately, there's one or two problems. Right? Exploitation is complex and dangerous. It's actually very difficult to do this nicely and to do it well. And it's not useful for a post-operating system installation attack. So once you've built your box, it's too late. You can't repartition things without really mucking stuff up. So we try not to do that. That means, actually, that you can't use it remotely. Right? If you break into a box, there's nothing you can do anymore because you'd have to take the box down, repartition it, rebuild everything, and bring it back up again. Sysadmins probably will notice that sort of thing. So we, we just have to use it for our local box as a way of storing data where it's not going to be found when some jackbooted thug kicks in our door. There's a high chance of data loss if we screw this up because you will wreck your entire hard drive. Right? You'll have to rebuild everything. And that means it's going to be very difficult to capture the data that you used to have there. And of course, it can break operating systems, which can be a bit ugly. So if we look at how a partition table is implemented, we look at the layout. 
Um, the terminology is confusing because just about everything within a partition table is actually called a partition table. So we have a partition table as the entire like uh, partition table. So it's a number of partition table vectors. Partition table vectors contain partition table descriptors. And I believe the terminology I'm using isn't even on the slide. That's, that's how bad this is. So <laughs> what you have is a number of arrays of descriptors. There's four descriptors per array. And they point to each other. So there's the first one, which is the primary partition table, not the entire partition table itself. The primary partition table can contain a pointer to one extended partition table. And there's one extended partition table can contain within it a number of logical partition tables and a number of additional extended partition tables. Right? So I hope that doesn't confuse anyone, because it confuses the hell out of me. This is, ooh, this is ugly. This is kind of what a partition table should look like. So at the beginning, you've got your first partition table. And this is the primary partition table that covers the, the, the primary partition tables, which would be the primary partitions. right? So that's the green arrow. Everything within the green arrow is primary. Everything within the blue arrow, which you probably can't see very well, is extended or logical. So yellow would be our first logical partition with the pointer to pink, which would be an extended partition. Within pink, we would have the pink arrow, which would be a logical partition, which would point to light green, which would be an extended partition, which would contain a logical partition, which points to nothing. Got that? OK. <laughs> No questions, good. All right, you don't really need to worry about this too much because um, I've, I've written software to abstract all of this away, so we, we can ignore that for now. However, we do need to know that there's a certain number of assumptions which are used when we treat partition tables, such as uh, the primary partition table can only contain one extended partition table, or that each extended partition table can only contain one logical partition, okay? So if we know that, we can start looking at our attacks. This is what our uh, partition entry, a partition description looks like. You can skip everything except you need to know uh, the type, which tells the, uh, the software that's interacting with it, whether, for instance, it's a swap partition or a Linux partition or NTFS or FAT. You need to know the first sector, and you need to know the number of sectors. Right? So that's where it starts and how big it is. Now, if we look at the attacks, there's four basic attacks that I've come up with. One of them is the excessive extended partitions. There's actually buffer overflows in quite a lot of forensic software based on the assumption that there will never be more than a certain number of extended partitions. The number is usually 80 or 100, so it's quite logical in the real world. What we know as hackers, that if we want to, we can create 1,000 extended partitions. And by doing that, we will find that the software that's supposed to do, conduct the analysis on our hard disk, it's going to break. But it's not designed to handle that sort of thing. It's not designed to handle aggressive malicious input. We can have extra extended partition table vector enter entries. What that means is for each of the extended partition tables, we have the assumption that there's only one logical partition and one extended partition. If we create more entries than that, if, so if we use the entire thing up, it can be invisible. It's not always. Uh, most modern software doesn't fall for this sort of trick. But it's possible to get away with it. We can also have errors in alignment. So we can create partition tables that don't actually occupy the entire disk. This is a very, very common attack used by pedophiles. They'll create an extended partition with a logical partition. They will edit their uh, partition table, and they will delete that partition, and it won't be there. Then when they want to access it, they'll just re-edit it and put it back in and play around. It's usually fairly, fairly easy to spot, because if you've got a file system that's only 38 gigs and you've got a 40 gig disk, you can pretty much guess that there's probably something at the back there. Um, you can do it in a lot more subtle ways, of course. Like uh, you, can, you can actually have the alignments overlap, and that can cause a lot of errors. Because while you don't necessarily need to use that sort of space, when the software comes through and it's trying to map everything and figure out what's going on, it's going to have buffers that interact badly. Uh, all right, And we can also do fisting attacks at the partition table there. But I don't think we want to look at that. So. I could probably skip the, the actual details because I went through these, but we can cause a lot of error conditions by simply creating more than an n number of extended partitions. Uh, and this is due to uh, very, very stupid assumptions that get made. For instance, uh, FDISC assumes that there's only 80. Uh, I think CFDISC assumes that there's 100. Uh, the Linux kernel is OK, but it eventually runs out of uh, memory because it, it creates a linked list of partitions. So you can, you can use up kernel memory. That's bad. As it's a, a bad attack. Right? It's not very useful, I don't think. 
Uh, this is also not particularly useful because most modern operating systems actually look in this area. Forensics tools tend not to, to look uh, so well, and people who are doing manual inspections can miss it, but it's one of the attacks that we can use. So this is where we create additional extended partition tables or, or logical partitions within extended partition table uh, vectors. All right, the alignment issues, as I said, these are very commonly used, uh, typically with creating additional space. Uh, there's some other attacks, which I won't mention here, that um, I used in the course, and I found out just how effective they are. But you can basically, you can avoid all sorts of, all sorts of analysis with alignment issues. I'll leave it at that. So <clears throat> if we look at fisting, we can find uh, something like 500 bytes in total per partition table that we can use. So each partition table starts at an offset within a partition, and that's usually 32K of space that we, we're provided with plus a little bit of space within the partition table itself. So if we have a large number of partition tables, we can end up with you know, almost a megabyte of space. Ooh. Not a very, very good attack. Poor, poor high capacity storage, not good. All right. uh, that should be it. Yeah, OK, good. So we can now look at actual attacks within the file system, or uh, how, to how to destroy your file system in a few easy steps. So if we look at what we're, going to be, what we're going to be examining, we need to first understand how file systems are implemented and the core components that make up file systems. Then we're going to look at a slightly specific implementation, which is ext2. And then after that, we're going to go into specific attacks against ext2. So if we look at a file system, it's basically made up of four layers. We've got the file system layer, which is essentially a header file. Right? It describes the entire file system for everyone else. So all of our software is going to need the file system layer to interact with the rest of the file system. We're going to have a data content layer. This is where all of the user data is stored. So this is the easiest to access portion. This is what you're probably most familiar with. We're going to have the metadata layer, which is going to be used to organize the data layer so that we can randomly access content within that layer. So this is going to contain timestamp information, organization information, ownership information. It's basically going to be our files. Our files are organized from the metadata layer. And then finally, we need to have a name layer, which provides a human-readable access uh, point into the metadata information. So typically, our metadata is going to be referenced by a number. So we'll have inode 1, 2, 3, 4 through n. Uh, in the MFT, we have MFT entries that are numbered. In all of these file systems, metadata is accessed by number, but human beings need file names. That's the name layer. Pretty straightforward. Ooh, animations. OK, so on our Unix file system, our, our file system information at the file system layer is called the super block. And it contains information such as the size, the number of blocks, where to find the start of the inode table, how many inodes there are, how many are free, how many are used, all of this sort of basic information that you need in order to figure out what's going on within the file system. So it's, as I said, it's just a header file. It needs to be at a fixed location. Once you've found that, you can generally find anything else. Uh, at the data content layer, we have something that we call a block, which is essentially one or more sectors put together that we can address. And it's the lowest atomical component of the file system. So on Unix, we're typically going to see 4K or 8K blocks. On the XT2, it's usually 4K, although that depends a little bit on the size of the overall file system. At the metadata layer, we have something called an inode, which you've probably, you've probably heard of it before. But we're going to look exactly at how they work and how they're implemented. Uh, inodes basically, as I say, they, they organize blocks so that you can access them contiguously. And they organize, uh, basically, they, they organize all the information that you need to know about a file into one place. So they've got the MAC times, which is your modification, access, and creation time. They've got ownership information. They've got permissions. They've got all of this good stuff that we're used to. And then finally, at the main layer, we have something called a directory file, which is just a normal file based on an inode. But the <coughs> content is formatted in a specific way that can be interpreted to link names to inode numbers. So all right. yeah, this is the basic information that you're going to find in an inode. It's metadata information about a file. Inodes are files, remember that. So you've got your time step information, which is very important from a forensics point of view, because you're going to use that when you construct your timeline of events. But more importantly, as users, it's got your permissions, your ownership, your size, your block count, your reference counts, and 
on and on and on and on. Uh, and it's going to contain a list of data blocks. This list of data blocks is going to be where all the content is stored. There's several types of data blocks, right? We've got direct blocks, which are blocks whose numbers are stored in the inode that actually contain data, right? So a direct block actually contains data. An indirect block contains a list of direct blocks. A doubly indirect block contains a list of indirect blocks. And a trebly indirect block contains a list of doubly indirect blocks. Got that? Right, we've got a graphic. So basically, you have all the block pointers. These are just block numbers. And they indicate where to look for your data. Right? So you access them sequentially. You access your block pointer sequentially. And it allows you to access the file content sequentially. Very, very straightforward. So you've got your direct pointers over here, the points of three data blocks. You've got one indirect block, which contains an extension to the array of direct blocks. And that points on to direct blocks there. Okay, So that's basically what an inode contains. That's what it looks like. That's how it functions. Everyone's happy? We're inode experts? Cool. All right. So if we look at directory structures, a directory file is basically made up of an array of these things. They're called directory entries. Each directory entry contains two vital pieces of information. One is the inode, and the other one is the name. So these entries pair inode numbers to names. When a file is deleted, this information is still retained, but it is altered so that you cannot access it. I'm going to have a look at that. Oh, I can't see that very well. OK, so the information that you see here, the record length, that tells you how long this particular directory entry is. The name length tells you how long the name is. This is useful because it uh, is not null terminated. So what you have is a situation like this. We've got a lost and found with the inode 11. And it's 16 bytes long. So we take our current position, we add the record length, we get the next entry. We get lame file, it's inode 13, again, 16 byte lo bytes long. We take our current position, we add the size, we get our next entry. This puts us to some file, it's 32 bytes long, because what's happened is a deleted file, which is called deleted, uh, exists. When a file is deleted, the preceding directory entry has its record length incremented so that when we're iterating over all of the entries, we don't actually see it. Right? So when we take our record length here, we bounce straight over it and we get to the last file. We're going to look at why this is important when we get to an attack that we can use against directory files for data storage. So this leaves us with uh, a few implementations. Uh, I don't think we're going to use any demos, but basically we've got RuneFS, which uses the bad blocks inode for data storage. We've got WAFNFS, which uses a spoofed journal file for data storage. We've got KYFS, which uses null directory entries. And we use DataMuleFS, which uh, uses reserved space and padding within the file system. All right. So the RuneFS attack basically relies on a, a very old implementation of TCT, which was broken, uh, though it took them nine months to fix this one line of code, which tells you just how effective uh, full disclosure is against uh, forensics tools. So anyway, you start out with uh, a couple of pieces of information. First of all is, for historic reasons, you cannot use inode 0 on a file system. inode 0 was used to indicate an error when you were doing an inode allocation in the kernel. So you can't use inode 0 actually on the disk. inode 1 was used to store bad blocks. So when bad blocks were found on the hard disk, they were linked to inode 1. They wouldn't be used in user files. You're safe. That meant that the first inode that we could use to actually start uh, storing information was inode number 2, which would be at position 3, of course. So inode 2 is our root file. It's slash. From 2, we can start accessing the rest of the file system hierarchy, the rest of the directory structure. So what we look at is basically TCT had uh, this piece of code in it, which said if an inode is less than the root inode or greater than the last inode, it's invalid. But what we know is that's not true, because the bad blocks inode is a valid inode. So it's basically just really bad bounds checking. And then uh, the implementation was pretty straightforward. We just created a regular file that we did data storage in. Uh, it was kind of funny, because I, this, this was a, the, the code was actually released after I'd already implemented the attack. So I, I implemented the attack before there were any forensics tools. And by the time the forensics tools came out, the attack was still effective. I like that. 
We've got WaffenFS. Uh, WaffenFS exploits a small issue with how uh, ext2 is implemented. Basically, ext2 and ext3 are identical file systems, except that on ext3, there's a journal. And a journal is just a special file that the kernel uses to keep track of changes it's made to the file system. So in case that there's a crash, it can recover and figure out what was going on and hopefully patch the whole thing together. Now, when the kernel is mounting a file system, it relies on information from etcfs tab. etcfs tab is obviously at, you know, an application layer. It's pretty high up. But when something like fsck or a forensics tool is examining the file system, it has to rely on information provided in the file system header. So in the super block, we can say this is an ext3 file system. We can create a journal file, and then we'll find that the kernel is still mounted as ext2. That means that our journal file will not be updated. It will not actually be accessed by the kernel. It will simply be an invisible file that we can do data storage in. This allows us to exploit forensics tools, because forensics tools make the claim that they support ext3, when in fact they support ext2. They simply, they simply say, look, it's the same file system fundamentally, so if we support one, we support the other. They fail to take into account that they have to conduct analysis on the journal file. They never do. You're all good. Um, usually, you get about 32 megabytes of space. Uh, anyone who's ever stored a root list anywhere knows just how big that is. And you could probably store the internet on that. So excuse me. The next one is KYFS, which stands for Kill Your File System. Um, I had a lot of fun implementing this one, and I lost a lot of data. But it does work now. <laughs> Basically, what we do is we exploit the fact that directory entries can take up an arbitrary amount of space, and they can also be invisible. Right? So if we can add an arbitrary number of directory entries to a directory file, we can increase that directory file to just about any size that we like. And because it's not going to be used, for instance, we can use something like uh, user share locale ES. Right? No one's going to be updating their user share locale. That never happens. What that means is all of our data can stay safe. It's not going to be altered. No one's going to be adding or appending or modifying that directory entry. So what we can go ahead and do is we can create a deleted entry that is the size of one block. And we can do that an arbitrary number of times for any directory file. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you understood the directory files, which I'm sure all of you did, because no one stopped me when I was talking about them, you'll understand this. So we set the inode to, to 0, which indicates that it's been deleted. We set the, the size of the entry to the block size, and we're done. That's it. We can then start using the rest of the space for data storage. And let's see what my next slide is. OK. So this is the code that's going to be in the kernel or in FSCK, or, or any other tool that interacts with the file system in a legitimate fashion. It's going to iterate over our directory using the record length, and it's going to check the inode. If the inode's zero, it'll just continue. It'll go, whoops, deleted, onto the next one. So we can iterate over an arbitrary number of these deleted, these null directory entries. Our forensics code, on the other hand, is going to be trying to find deleted names. So it's going to be checking for a name length that's greater than zero, and if it, an inode that equals 0 and a name length greater than 0. If it's got an inode that equals 0 and a name length greater than 0, obviously it's found a deleted directory entry. So there's absolutely no points for figuring out how we bypass this attack. OK, so that is pretty much it for uh, the, the elite attacks. Now we're on to some stuff that's a lot more common. Um, data mule is basically the, in the same sense of a drug mule. You force the file system to, fo to swallow your data and then cough it back up when you want it. So what you look for is areas of the file system that are not accessed. This is reserved areas or padded areas. So when you've got reserved areas within the file system, it usually means that you've got a byte here or four bytes there. And it's not a lot of space individually, but collectively, it can be a reasonable quantity. And it's also never going to be touched by the kernel. It's never going to be touched by FSCK. And it's never going to be touched by the forensics tools, because when they look at metadata, they don't examine the reserved areas. They simply look at the information within the metadata. So that allows us to uh, basically store almost any data that we want. All right. So if we look at a particular implementation, we've got ext2, where we've got in the super block 759 bytes. In a group descriptor, we've got 14 bytes. And in an inode, we've got 10 bytes of space. 
for your average one gig file system that allows you to store over a meg of data simply in inodes. Right? So you can store a massive amount of data in these tiny little chunks, and it's very hard for someone to put together because you can use a proprietary algorithm to figure out in which order they should be stored, and then you can encrypt on top of that, and you're good. All right, the out of bounds, beyond the disk level. OK. So we've looked briefly at the evidence prophylactics before. We're going to continue to look briefly at them because we're running short on time. But basically, uh, the major ones are Cisco proxying and MOSDEF. Cisco proxying is where you execute code locally, but execute syscalls remo remotely. So you will execute system calls on the machine that you're trying to access, or the machine that you have access to, but you will execute all of the logic on your own machine, which means that there's no code that's actually uploaded to the remote box. So even if they dump memory, they will never actually know what you were trying to do. They'll just go, OK, he opened this file, he opened this connection, he did these things, that's it. They won't actually see your code. That's quite effective. Um, we've implemented this in uh, some, other, some other instances. But it's an effective way of limiting the amount of information that someone can capture, even from a honeypot. Most stuff actually doesn't work quite like that. It injects the code into the remote process and executes it there. But it still keeps it from ever touching the disk. All right, we've got in-memory execution. I, ro I wrote a tool called rexec, which wraps around GDB to provide this sort of access. Uh, and it operates over text. It's pretty cool. Uh, the PHC, the Frac I Council, uh, two days after I released U Userland Exec, they released a program called FTRANS, which uses uh, SSL to wrap a connection, uh, upload a binary, and then execute it directly into memory. They called it anti-honeypot anti technology, which is basically what this stuff is. It's, it's very, very effective anti-forensics attacks for a forensically hostile environment, such as a honeypot. Um, Common tools, all right, we'll skip through that. Basically, you can use shell scripts to do all sorts of stuff. You can preserve the file system state. You can clean logs. You can have backdoors. For instance, over here, this is a backdoor written entirely in Gork. All right, so here's your network backdoor in 10 lines of Gork. Pretty straightforward. Good news, horrible. Um, conclusion, forensics is just as vulnerable as any other security technology. It's no different, and it shouldn't be treated any differently. There's just as much reason for people to conduct analysis on forensic software as there is to conduct analysis on firewall software. Uh, your file system is not an accurate log of what's happened. You cannot trust it. It's just as broken as the rest of your software. And finally, we've owned your file system. So I believe that wraps it up. Are there any questions? When I heard your presentation before, you mentioned that you might be looking at your forensic tools of your own. Have you made any progress? I've made some progress, but they're not commercially viable just yet. So yeah, uh, I'll be providing them at some point, maybe this year. When it comes to data hiding, uh, NTFS streams, uh, uh, do they have any use? The, the ultimate data stream, um, no, because everyone knows about them, basically. The, the way that NTFS works is you have a file that's made up, actually, of, of things called attributes. And one of the attributes that can be associated with the file is a data attribute, which is data storage. And by default, all files get an unnamed data attribute. That's your normal content. You can also create named attributes. So you can create additional data uh, attributes with names on them. The attacks against NTFS actually operate, the ones that I know about anyway, operate at a much lower level than uh, at something like that. So you need to actually implement file system uh, software to really fuck around with them. Also, usually it's not worth bothering going that low on an NTFS system. If you're on Windows, the whole thing is so complex that you can get away with data storage in like a proprietary uh, format and claim that it's part of some uh, shareware tool that you downloaded. And the police or anyone doing an investigation is not really going to know what it's supposed to look like. They'd have to reverse engineer the entire format. Then they'd have to write their own tool. Then they'd have to figure out whether the metadata within the format that you've chosen is accurate or not based on what it should be most of the time. And it, I mean, it's just a lot easier to go in at that layer than at the file system layer, because the file system is very complex and very ugly. So that's my answer. Yes, what about PGP disks? Um, basically, if everything's encrypted, it's hard. It's very hard. It's not impossible, because uh, most people choose very, very bad passwords. 
So there's all sorts of password crackers that are used by the government. Um, there's some guys I know who know some guys who, you know, uh, sorry, this is like a friend of a friend sort of thing. Uh, but basically, they claim that there's a basement, and um, what happens is you take a disk, you hand it to these guys, they go in the basement, some number of days later, they come back, they hand you another disk, and that's the content. Right? So no one knows what happens inside there. They probably just sit there and they, they come up with whatever they feel like and you know, make false system disks. But <laughs> that, that is apparently how they break encryption. They've got, uh, they, they usually, like in, in the UK, they've got the Ripper Act, which means that um, if I say that you have to give me your password and I'm a judge, you have to give me your password or you have to go to jail. That's your choice. So usually what you want to do is you want to use multiple. Whoa. <laughs> But right. usually you want to use multiple <laughs> data hiding attack. Usually you want to use multiple data hiding uh, data encryption attacks. So you have your basic disk, and then within that you'd have data you don't really care about. So you take like generic porn, and you'd be like, I didn't want the wife and kids to know I was looking at porn, right? And that would be a short portion of it. And then at the back of that you'd have another encrypted disk, and that's where you put the goodies. So what happens is they say, give us your password. And you're like, oh no, that's my porn stash. They get the password, they look at it at your porn stash, they can't see anything else. They say, what else is there? You go, well, you know, you got me, it's you know, big black women. And that's that. So that's, that's the technique to get around encryption and to use encryption effectively. There's a question back there. No? All right. That's gone. How reliable is hiding data in directory entries? I mean, you, you write an entry for a deleted file when they always will if, if you allocate a file in that directory, there's a chance it will be overwritten. So the technique is to find a portion of the file system that's never updated. Uh, personally, I use the, the locale directory because no one ever updates their locale files. Right? And you get 70 directories in there, like ES, FR, like EM, all of that garbage. You've got a large amount of space in there simply by making each one of them one meg. It's not going to be noticed by any forensic software. And it means that you've got 71 meg files at 70 megs. That's a lot of space. You can do anything you like with that. So if you use something like temp, you're going to lose your data. Right? If you use something like user share locale ES and then a subdirectory of that, you're going to be all good. That's pretty much what it comes down to. No more questions? Any more answers? No? Cool. That's it then. Thank you.